tonight is the final talk. I'm sorry that this one had to be rescheduled a couple of times, um, but here we are. Thank you for being here. Um, final talk of our spring talk series. And as you all are probably aware, we're we're going pretty pretty hard recently with Project Swallowtail. We had our plant sale. We had a secondary pickup for the plant sale. We had another plant giveaway yesterday. Seed sitters are starting to get a lot of plants coming up. Um, and so if you have any questions about uh, like Project Swallowtail specific programming or anything like that, please keep it to emails uh, unless we happen to have an exorbitant amount of time for questions. Um, so just try to keep your questions to um, related to you know balcony gardening and all the various challenges and things that can come up with such work. Um, so I always try to, can everybody see my screen, by the way? Yes. Yes, okay. yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, I always try to contextualize land acknowledgements with, the, with, with what it is that we're going to be speaking about on that particular day or event or in that hour. And uh, this photo is very recent. Um, and this is Ryan and myself along the Humber River holding uh, a bunch of yellow irises. Um, for those of you who may not know, yellow irises are, are sort of an escaped ornamental species, you know, one of those classic invasives that we brought over. We were like, oh, this is such a pretty plant. And then we planted it in places and then it got away. And we're like, oh, no, it's everywhere. And now you can see it along uh, uh, wetland and uh, river systems all across southern Ontario. And um, we crossed a river barefooted, you know, the Humber moving quick get across and cut these irises down so that they couldn't drop their seeds and, and spread further along because part of our work or hope along the site and really anywhere we go is to try to help restore the, the native biodiversity of the space. And on this day, um, we were getting a lot of really cool learnings from Joseph B. the Monoclet, who came down from Peterborough and shared a lot of uh, teachings on plants and plant medicines and our relationships to them all. We talked about birds, we talked about botany, we talked about a whole bunch of different things. So it was really cool. Um, well, one thing uh, that came up was a person asked, um, asked Joseph, like, hey, are you comfortable sharing all of this information that you're sharing? Like, you know, we're like a mixed group of people, like this is indigenous knowledge is, is like secretive in some ways. And Joe, without hesitation, said, no, I, I don't censor what it is I say to people. And I was like, oh, shit, what? Why? And he's like, because it is the responsibility of everybody that lives on this land to know all of these bits and pieces of information about our ecology and about our relationships in order to live the best life that we can. And part of that work and part of that sentiment that I've heard repeatedly in a lot of uh, indigenous knowledge sharing circles is this idea of always trying to get a creature to live its best life. So you're trying as, as your individual self to enhance or improve or really just you know, guide in the best way the life of an individual plant, an individual animal, or an entire ecosystem. And we're talking today about these very forgotten and derelict pieces of property <laughs> that we have tons and tons of that have, that exist as habitat, you know, that because they exist, they are by definition habitat. They're not good habitat necessarily at all circumstances, but as people living in this context now, it is our responsibility to try and make these spaces as beneficial for ourselves and for other beings as much as possible. And that action can take you know, many different forms. You can go cut down some irises, you can deadhead some dog strangling vine, you can you know, talk to some people about um, you know, uh, the, the people struggling in your community, you can provide folks food to folks, or you can provide food to pollinators. And you can do that 
in all circumstances. And today's talk is really about being able to create that habitat with an ecological sense of exactly what it is that we're working with when we're talking about balconies. Uh, and when we're talking about these particular like concrete, you know, high above the ground environments. And so I'd really like to, you know, share my appreciation for this, this knowledge, this concept of ecological care that has somehow made its way into our general psyche in no small part, thanks to the thousands of years of indigenous presence and ongoing stewardship and cultivation of relationships with, through the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Cree, the Huron, the Wendat, the Salish, the Mi'kmaq, and many other nations who traveled and traded on this land before we ever got here. So that's our responsibility, hopefully recognized as native plant people, as plant people in general, as balcony livers, as backyard livers, uh, as people who have the capacity in whatever small way to help our ecosystems and help improve the quality of our environments, even if very slightly so. And so with that, um, tonight's talk, uh, I'm really excited to have Ryan here for, um, is going to be focused on um, the nuances and ins and outs of having the kind of environment that uh, Ryan has in his back background image right now, which is just a bump in balcony. It blows my mind how many species he has on there every time. Uh, this is part of uh, our spring talk series, as I said at the top. Um, we've had three other talks, um, all of which are recorded. Uh, and uh, I will be sharing the link to that playlist after this talk as well. This talk will also be on the same list. Um, so if you missed any, or if you're interested in, uh, you know, listening to some part because you were you forgot or missed it, don't worry about it. Just go and listen again. Um, I will just ask you to uh, keep your questions until the very end. If you're able to, please just keep put your questions into the Q and A box uh, instead of the chat box. Uh, just to keep a track of them all. And in case we don't manage to answer them all, it also helps us keep a record so that in future sessions, we know, you know what questions people had. Um, as I said, this will be uploaded to our YouTube list and I'll be in touch with you all um, uh, about it soon. And as I said, please keep all Project Swallowtail related questioning to emails. Um, and that's jk at pollinator.org. If for some reason you don't know that email, Y'all are new here. <laughs> and with that, I am really excited to have Ryan Godfrey here from World Wildlife Fund. He's a botanist, an avid native plant gardener, and an all round powerhouse of plant information. And truly, I think the gift that Ryan carries with him is the ability to inspire a sense of interest in plants. And I can tell you that. I am more fascinated about how plants reproduce than like ever having spoken to Ryan just a few times about evening primrose and some sea algae. So I'm excited for tonight. And without further ado, thanks, Ryan. I'm going to pass it over to you. All right. Thanks so much for the intro. Thanks for your always amazing land acknowledgments, Janae. They're the best out there. Um, and thanks for the invite today. And thanks audience. Um, I know some of the names here. Hello, everybody. Um, good to see you or see your names. Anyway, I can't see your faces, but um, I'm looking forward to your questions later on. Um, I'll take broad questions. Honestly, anything planty um, is all fair game. Q&A is my absolute favorite part of any of these things. So um, Janae, did you want to say something or you just you popped back on so that I could see you? That's good. I do like to be able to see one face. That's that's very kind. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. I, I popped off because I got a sneezing fit. So <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair, fair. Um, so, yeah, I guess before I jump into the presentation, I'll just say a little bit about why I have a garden like this in the first place. Like, what, who the heck decides to do something so crazy? Because I'll tell you, like, the number of people who told me that this would not work and that it was a fool's errand, um, I, I stopped counting. At some, at some point, I was just like, you know, I don't want to listen to the haters. <laughs> I want to just figure it out, you know? Um, so really, my story 
with native plants begins uh oh i don't know a problem maybe a maybe maybe when i was a little a little young and bumbling around in oakville ontario which is where i grew up um underneath the canopy of giant oak trees two there were two i was very lucky to have two uh 200 plus year old oak trees on my property growing up um and i I hung out under their shade. I tripped over their acorns. I actually vacuumed their acorns up with a shop vac on several occasions. And so I kind of joke, but sort of don't joke that I think those those oaks cursed me <laughs> for vacuuming up so many of their babies. They're like, okay, you wanna you wanna play that game? We're gonna force you to learn everything humanly possible about us and all of our relatives and so maybe that's why i'm obsessed i don't know but certainly all jokes aside like growing up surrounded by green surrounded by plants by big trees no doubt had a huge impact on me and my my journey took many twists and turns since since then but eventually i found myself into the realm of ecology ecological science um biological science, genetics. I started doing field trips around. I started learning about um, native plants in an ecological context. So, you know, textbooks and going on field trips, that sort of stuff. And um, at some point I really, again, like my journey just took me randomly to um, Christie Pitts, which is where I'm actually going after this. Christie Pitts Park in um, Toronto. You folks all probably know it. Um, and I saw something very unusual, which were green tents with people wearing green aprons and they were selling native plants. These, this was the North American Native Plant Society and they were doing one of their annual plant sales. And here I was seeing Solomon's seal and rose twisted stock and trilliums and buttercups and milkweeds and all kinds of these species that I'd been learning about from the wild, but here they were being sold for people to plant in their gardens. And I literally had never thought about doing that. It, it hadn't crossed my mind that a garden is a place for native plants until I started talking with these people and learning about them and, and the ways that they're connecting with the plants. And I was like, all of a sudden I was like, wow, this is like a no brainer. Obviously we should all be doing this. <laughs> I was like an instant convert. <laughs> so the next year I was behind the tables helping to sell the plants. Now I've been working with the, 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 the Native Plant Society for over nine years. I am intermittently on the board and the plant sale committee and various other things. But um, I had a challenge, which was I lived downtown Toronto with a condo. How the heck was I gonna grow all these species that I wanted to learn about, I wanted to have in my life. Um, and so I basically just dedicated myself to the challenge of growing native plants in containers, which again, as I said, most people told me was not gonna be possible to do. I learned, I learned through a lot of failure. Um, I tried uh, a lot of different things and I'm gonna share with you some of the stuff that I've learned over um, a grand total of I'm going to say eight winters, and I'm counting winters because winters are the hardest part. Anybody can grow native plants in containers for the summer. Do it. Try it. You will You will succeed. You will definitely succeed. Um, the hard part is getting them to perinate, to grow year after year, um, which most native plants are capable of doing. And um, it is possible to do in containers. It just takes a couple of little tricks, and I had to learn those my own self. And I'm going to share them with you, the little tricks um, today. Some of it's about species selection. Some of it is about container selection. Some of it is about how you manage the plants during different parts of the year. So we're going to talk about all those things. We're going to look at some pretty pictures of plants. And then we're going to go outside and look at my actual balcony. And we're going to talk a little bit about watering, which is the really important uh, management aspect for the summer. Uh, it's really the only thing that I do with my native plant garden in the summer is occasional watering, and we'll, so we'll get there. We'll get there when we get there. But for now, uh, let's let's. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, this one, share. And we're going to talk about things. This is an adapted presentation that I I've given before, but so we might just zip through some things. But I I do like to start always uh, on a level playing field in terms of um, terms and definitions. So 
we'll just take a moment to go through some words here. A garden is a place where any people, any place where plants and people are in a reciprocal relationship is actually the terminology that I use now. Plants grow, people care for them. Yes, that's part of it. But there's a back and forth that happens. And you'll see how that works in my garden. Um, it can happen through harvest, through um, seed sharing. It can happen through uh, lots, lots of different ways, through mental health. Literally, my balcony garden is what got me through the pandemic, folks. <laughs> I couldn't have survived without it. Um, so it is 100% a two-way relationship that's going on in, in any uh, garden for sure, is what I've learned. Um, ecology is the study of relationships between living organisms and their non-living environment. You know, some people would say that the environment is living too, and I, I'm really very open to that perspective as well. Um, it's It sort of blows my brain, but that's fun to think about. <laughs> um, but isn't it interesting that like here again, we're talking about relationships. We're talking about the, you know, ecology, fundamentally is the study of relationships and that includes people, the relationships that people have with um, the living world. Um, ecological restoration is assisting in the recovery of degraded or destroyed ecosystems for the benefit of both humans and non-humans, the rest of nature. Humans of course are embedded in nature, um, are part of nature and um, you know, ecological restoration work is something that can happen on large and small scales, I believe. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Stewardship is the responsible use and protection of the natural environment through conservation and sustainable practices. So gardening is one of the things that you can do that is stewardship um, for sure. Um, native plants, many different definitions for this term, um, but the one that I'm talking about here, I think y'all are familiar with this now, being that this is the last of, of the series here. Uh, but just as a reminder, these are the regional flora, those plants that have evolved in a particular place for thousands of years. They're adapted to local conditions and have co-evolved with other organisms. So all those aspects, the time, the relationships, the adaptation, all crucial to the definition of a native plant. And it's what makes them irreplaceable there is no other species that can that can fill that that um, niche um, habitat is any area that contains features essential to the life cycle needs of an organism so my balcony is a habitat for a full habitat for nobody but a partial habitat for many because it's providing some of the features essential for the life cycle needs of a whole bunch of different organisms. So although those organisms, their habitat extends beyond my balcony garden, the balcony is still part of the habitat. Horticulture is the art or practice of garden design and maintenance, something that I am not trained in, but I pretend that I know something about from time to time. I think a lot of horticult horticulturists would find me to be um, to be <laughs> just really radical in a lot of senses, uh, but you know, I it it's it is it it is an art. It's an art form understanding how to grow and maintain plants and gardens, and it's something that everyone can practice. Uh, even though, of course, you can spend a long time learning about it too. Um, and a botanist is an expert or student. Um, in the study of plants. So Janaid, you're, I, I think you're a student in the study of plants now, so you, you can start to call yourself a botanist. It's, at some point, you just cross a threshold where you can say it. <laughs> but today I'm your personal botanist, and so you can ask me questions about plants. Um, okay, let's, with that underway, let's go ahead. Okay, so blah, 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 nature's in crisis, we know this. Um, lots of species going extinct, what are we going to do about it? Okay, here's Southern Ontario. Uh, the green is healthy um, habitats. The white is stuff that has changed to the point where it's really hard for life to survive there. Um, and there's not very much green is, is all I'm gonna say about this. So essentially this is just recognizing, whoops, um, that we need to restore and enhance habitats across this entire area. Um, and a lot of this is private land. So you can't count on governments to do this work, you got to do it yourself. And so every space 
that is available, including balconies, including rooftops, including patios, um, needs to be used, needs to be restored and enhanced in the best way possible. Um, I just talked about ecology. It's the relationships between living and non-living world. There's all these patterns. It's very complicated cycles, like the cycle of seasons, webs, like a food web, layers, like the strata of geology, um, all intermixed happen in ecology at the same time. So it can get very, very complicated. I'm gonna do my best today to distill some ecological knowledge for you. And really you already know this because your project's volatile pollinator stewards at this point, but um, the way to do ecological restoration is you plant native plants. Okay, we get it, <laughs> we get it. <laughs> um, here's what that looks like sometimes, you know, so here's a restored marsh. Um, this is kind of the traditional large scale restoration. Um, this is called Rattray Marsh. People may have visited it in um, Mississauga, uh, Ontario. So, you know, they planted a whole bunch of plants and lots of creatures live there. Beautiful, love it, pristine. Where are the people? Who knows? <laughs> Behind the camera, apparently. <laughs> um, what about here? This is the Don Valley. Lots more people, lots more infrastructure, lots more invasive species. How do you do restoration here? Same way, plant native plants, simple. Um, what about here? <laughs> Downtown Toronto during uh, WWF's Earth Hour. So we shut off the lights. Did that do enough? No, no. <laughs> Shutting off the lights for one hour is not going to save the planet. Um, so how do you restore uh, an ecosystem like this? Hmm, you have to get creative. You have to think, think hard. Um, maybe we shouldn't have built a thing like this in the first place. That's a good question, <laughs> but we did. And now we have to do our best to build um, ecosystems, healthy ecosystems here. One way to do that would be cover all these buildings with native plants. It's possible folks. And I'm gonna show you how to do it. <laughs> um, what makes an ecosystem? Okay, so here's just how to, again, this is probably for review for y'all at this point, but I'll go through this really quickly. Three, three things that I think about when I'm trying to think about restoring an ecosystem is who for, so the biodiversity, which species are going to live there, um, bees, butterflies, birds, snakes, frogs, fish, and, and the plants, obviously. Um, who's going to be there? What kind of features do they need? How am I going to measure when they show up? Um, how happy they are? How healthy they are? Obviously, you know this is a big deal. This is one of the things that people are most excited about with native plant gardens, is you're going to see more biodiversity there, which is amazing. Uh, but there's more than that. The ecosystem services or gifts, the things that you, the gardener, are going to enjoy for free from your garden. Think about these things. Plan for them. Build them in. Um, and then measure them or just experience them <laughs> there. This is a wonderful thing. If you're not thinking about this part, then you're missing out on like a really, really big important part of um, native plant garden habitat ecosystems. Um, and then finally, I like to think about connectivity. So that's what Project Swallowtail is kind of all about, right? We're trying to connect people, neighborhoods, parks, um, corridors throughout the city um, into, you know, this interconnected web of, of ecology. So remember that your garden is not an island isolated from its surroundings. You're connected to your neighbors, maybe connected to ravines or other parks or green spaces, in particular flying <laughs> creatures like bees and butterflies and birds literally are just passing through from one, from one place to another. They're, they're not inhibited in any way. So you are connected in so many different ways and it's important to think about that from time to time. So just think about those things. That's all I'm gonna say. And ask what your green space is doing. That I got from Lorraine Johnson. Did Lorraine give one of these talks? She did, didn't she? She was- La Last year. I last haven't year. gotten okay. her this year, yes. Okay, well, Lorraine Johnson is amazing. She's one of my um, mentors, friends, amazing people in life. And she, she taught me this, to ask, look at the green space and ask, what does this green space do? What is it doing for biodiversity ecosystem services connectivity. It's not just about the way that it looks, it's what is it doing? Okay, so you can do all these things. Ding, 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 ding. Save the world. Here's how I did it on my balcony. 
So I grow over 30 different species of native plants on my balcony. I've had, I've observed over 12 species of bees and other insects on my balcony. Recently, lots of spiders. I've been noticing a whole ton of little spiders that are spinning little webs between these, uh, these railings. Hilarious. I love them. They're so cute. Jumping spiders in particular are like, I'm, I'm always overjoyed to see them. Um, ecosystem services. Um, I didn't, yeah, the calming oasis. Oh my gosh, I cannot overemphasize this, folks. Like, I need this place to be sane to the extent that I am. Um, but also the harvesting. I harvest lots of nice smelling plants that I use to make tea. Um, and, and I grow herbs. I've grown, you know, uh, beans and peas, tomatoes on my balcony too. You can do that in a native plant garden. It's okay. You don't have to have 100% of your plants be native plant species. You can grow food in there too, guys. Just, it's fine. <laughs> and then in terms of connectivity, <clears throat> I do seed sharing. Um, some of you may have received some of my seeds or seedlings. I don't know. Um, I do that every year. It's, I think it's really important especially when you have a small space, it feels so much bigger when you share it. So do that, <laughs> that's my recommendation to you. And then also there's connectivity, direct connectivity with the trees. So I'm on the sixth floor, which is just about at canopy level of the linden trees, linden basswood hybrids, I think they are, that are right outside of my building. Um, linden is known in Europe where it's native as the bee tree. So honey bee producers um, grow lindens for the purpose of um, feeding their bees, but lots and lots of native bees, including carpenter bees and all kinds of other bumblebees and stuff, love those trees, climb up to the top. And then they, I think I'm imagining, they see my garden and they go, ooh, that's fun. <laughs> and then they, they pop over and they, they spend a little bit of time over with me, which is really nice. So that's connectivity too. Um, okay, so containers. That was just sort of the context. Um, containers. Container gardening is as old as people, I believe, really. Like, think about the up here. This is a picture I stole from Wikipedia when I looked up the garden, the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It's a container garden, folks. It's in the desert, and they're growing dates and ferns and all kinds of things. And um, they're doing it in containers and raised beds above the ground that they're irrigating. So like, it's it goes way, way, way back. Um, bonsai is a really fascinating form of container gardening, famous in East Asia. Um, it, not just Japan, there's forms of bonsai in China and the Philippines. They're all fascinating and different and wonderful. And I don't know how to do it, but I love the people who do grow trees in containers. Like what, they are the same kind of crazy that I am. <laughs> That's what I think is going on there. Like to think that you can grow a, a tree in a container and make it look like a miniaturized version of a big tree out in the wild is like, that takes a really special brain and I love it. A lot of people grow succulents or um, terrariums in containers indoors. That's something that I do as well. And, um, you know, a lot of people too, this, this picture here on the right is from um, a trip that I took to South England, um, a, a town I'm forgetting the name of, right on, on, the, on the shore. And th this is what, what the town is like. It's all the homes are basically this sort of terraced um, townhouse kind of style thing. And they've got these alleyways in the back. And the number of container gardens, oh my gosh, everybody had them. I was so impressed. Vines crawling up the walls, uh, roofs covered in mosses and things. And, um, you know, like this is, this is the culture. This is what they do. And I love it. So we should all be doing it too. Why not? One of the really cool things about containers is you can sort of create your own little microclimate habitat of whatever kind you want. The more different it is from the actual environment around you, the more effort it's going to take to maintain that. But hey, if you've got the time and the resources and the effort to maintain a desert, um, then do that. You can do that. Why not? Um, it's totally possible. Um, yeah, that's what I'll say about that. So it's really important to assess your conditions. Um, you absolutely should do this, um, especially for, for native plant gardens. Like you need to know what you're starting with. So um, light, water, soil, wind, and other fauna are I think the, the most important things to look at. So we'll look at each of those 
um, in turn. Light is crucially, crucially important. First of all, I wanna say if any of you listening have a north facing balcony, I don't know what to, you should do. <laughs> Honestly, um, if you get zero light, like try ferns maybe, um, get creative. I believe in you, I think you can do it. I just don't know. I've never worked with a totally zero light balcony, but my contention is that if you've got a minimum of three to four hours of light, which most people have if they're, they've got a, a, a east or a west exposure, or certainly if you have a southern exposure, you're fine, then you're good to go. You, you can do this for sure. But what you should do is create a light map. So this is my kind of janky version of a light map here. Pay attention to the thing up top. So I have a west facing exposure. So light does not come to my balcony until the afternoon. So on this day, uh, this was on April 28th, 2019, um, I recorded the first light on my balcony, which was at 1230. And it was these, do you see my cursor going back and forth? So these these parallel lines going this way. So it was ding, 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 ding. So, so this is west, folks. This is uh, north. And so, so the light is coming in sort of at this angle. Um, and so that's what I did at first light, you know, 1230. Then at one o'clock, I came back. At three o'clock, I came back. Five o'clock, I came back. Seven o'clock, I came back. And I did the same thing. So I hashed those lines in every time that um, I did a recording. And what you see is the light accumulation. So where those, those lines um, cross a lot, like they do in this section, you're getting a lot more light. And where they're not crossing very much at all, which you're getting in this section, that's because I have a wall here. There's a wall. Um, that's less light and it actually amounts to quite a bit. So when you do the calculations, it turns out that this area is getting only about four hours of direct sunlight and this area is getting like six and a half to seven. So a container that's up in this corner is getting significantly different light conditions. And actually I grow very different plants. Over here in this corner, I grow shade plants. I actually grow forest understory plants like, um, zigzag goldenrod and uh, woodland strawberry and Solomon seals and things like that. In this corner, I grow alvar plants like um, Canada hawkweed and um, cylindrical blazing star. And I do a different species of strawberry, wild strawberry. So even on my tiny little two meter by three meter balcony, I have variation in my growing conditions. And I would I really didn't know that until I did the light map. So do a light map. Um, down here, you could just see, I was playing around with what would happen if I put up shade cloth in different locations. Because at this time, I was very concerned about wind. Because um, wind is one of the biggest issues that I have on my sixth floor balcony. Wind obviously gets more intense the higher up you go. So I was wondering if I put shade cloth on this side, the south side versus the north side, what would that do to my light? And, um, you know, it's just sort of fun to play around with light. Light's amazing. It's like the center of life for plants is light. So you should tap into it if you want to understand how plants work. <laughs> um, in the end, I ended up deciding I did do shade cloth for one year um, and it did work to abate the wind. But over the course of a year and a half, the shade cloth sort of uh, degraded and got really ratty and weird looking. So I have since decided not to do that. And I just accept, I embrace the wind. The wind happens. And so I try to grow plants that are not going to be too negatively affected by the wind. And those plants, by the way, hot tip, are ones with small leaves or very long and narrow leaves, like grass type leaves or lily type leaves, um, fern shaped leaves that are, are kind of airy, flowy. Um, so large, large leaved plants, it acts like a flag. It's going to just like flap around in the wind and it's going to get hurt and you're not going to enjoy that. Nobody, nobody's going to enjoy that. So avoid, if, you, if wind is a problem for you, just avoid large leaved plants is my recommendation. Um, water. So another interesting thing to think about is water. So my balcony, again, this side here is the part that's out. Um, and this part is, is in next to the building. So when it rains, 
these containers or this section all gets wet, but this section does not get wet. So that's another thing to think about. So I put, for that reason, I put all my containers at the edge and the containers that are further in, I water them a little bit more. So I know that they're not getting rain um, or not as much rain. It really has to be blowing. The wind has to be blowing in the right kind of way. Um, soil, do I talk about soil later? No, not really. I will talk about soil. Um, I have tried lots of different things. Um, I've tried peat-based potting soil. I've tried sand. I've tried gravel. I've tried coconut coir. Um, I would actually love a substrate that's made out of composted leaves, but I don't know where I can buy it in quantity. If someone wants to make it for me, <laughs> like composted leaf, I will try it. Um, City of Toronto does that through really? uh, Community Environment Days. That's oh. the soil that you can get at the Community Environment Days is leaf litter collected from people's yards. Okay, I love yeah. that. I, so I do get that and I use it as an amendment. So I add a little bit of that every spring um, and like worm castings, composted manure, a little bit of that every spring. But uh, for the most part, I would say most of my containers are half peat-based potting soil and half gravel or sand is what I've come to that works really well for lots of different conditions, lots of different plants. Um, if you do only peat-based potting soil, it is lighter, uh, but I, what I find is it gets compacted over time and it won't hold the water the way that you want it to. So I find that adding the gravel, I'm not quite sure how this works, but adding in 50% gravel mixed in um, prevents compaction, weirdly. And I've had containers for four years now with that mix that are wonderful. They, they still behave the way that they did when I first put them together. So that's my recommendation. But I also I have one container that's just sand, full beach sand. And I grow cactuses in there, and they love it. So you know, there, there's lots of different options, but you know, consider matching the conditions of the plant's native ecosystem. That makes sense. We'll talk more about that later. Um, fauna, yeah, like, do you have squirrels? Do squirrels come up to your balcony? If so, <laughs> get ready for them. <laughs> Think about what that's gonna be. Do grackles come up to your balcony like they do on mine and pull out all your baby seedlings? Yes, yes, they will do that. They, they love to do that. So get ready for that too. I So I cover my seedlings with, um, you know, I'm a seed sitter. I've got the, the kit. So I've got the chicken wire. Works a charm. I've seen the grackles land on the chicken wire, be perplexed and annoyed and then fly away. <laughs> so <laughs> um, think about those creatures. They're going to be there. They're part of your ecosystem. They're not pests. They're not, um, you know, vermin. <laughs> They're your neighbors and you got to form relationships with them too. So that's, that's what that's all about. Um, happy to answer questions about that when they come. Actually, are there questions? And it just asks actually, uh, yeah. if you have a problem with pigeons, either landing or nesting on your balcony, and if you pack a lot of pots onto your balcony, does that discourage them? Interesting. Okay, so there are pigeons around in my area, a lot of them. And they do land on other balconies. They do land sometimes on my balcony. But pigeons are cliff creatures. So they live on, on like in their native range, Europe, France, the Pyrenees, I believe. They, they live on cliffs. And I think their natural habitat, the thing that they're looking for is a bare rock face. That's what they want to, to find, to perch on and roost on and nest and all that. Um, so my belief, my theory is that by growing lots of vegetation on my balcony, it actually doesn't look like pigeon habitat anymore. It now looks like some other kind of thing. It's like a hanging prairie garden, something or other. Like it, it's a little bit too vegetated for pigeons to enjoy. And like I said, they, they do show up sometimes, but uh, more often I see in the springtime, red-winged blackbirds and grackles. Recently, I've had um, a lovely male robin has been showing up in the mornings and, and singing, which is like, you know, so that's more of, they like more vegetated, more kind of like treed or grassy kind of areas. And so apparently that is the habitat that I've created. Um, so that's, that's my answer to that. I, I do believe that a densely vegetated balcony will just not be 
what pigeons are looking for. They'll go somewhere else. Pete has also concurred this in the chat, um, saying that they are hardwired to cliffs and caves, seacoast or inland, and definitely minimal vegetation. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Pete's also working on three batches of leaf mold, maples and elm, that you are welcome to. Okay, uh, okay, he's thanks, also Pete. using last year's leaf mold in his own potting mix. So. Okay, good, good idea. Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, I, I think that is the way to go. The, the peat based potting soil works. Peat is just, it's, it's a plant that is, it builds its own habitat, which is a bog and it's very good at absorbing water. That's what it does. So it's, it's very spongy. It's, it's um, antimicrobial, which may be good, maybe bad. I'm not sure, but it works. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> mostly an empiricist. The theory behind it is one thing, but it just works. And that's why I use it. Um, Okay, materials, these are important. So this is basically the entirety of what I use on my balcony. I have these little, um, little, like, they look like play tools, but they fit, okay, don't make fun of me. They, they, they suit the scale of my garden, okay? They're little, they can get into all the little nooks and crannies. I wasn't um, gonna say anything. <laughs> um, I use um, secateurs to, to trim, um woody vegetation sometimes i'm not very good at growing trees but to the extent that i try i use secateurs to prune them and this is my favorite tool of all time uh it's called the hori hori um but it's basically just a gardening spade a very sharp um knife gardening knife to to dig um on top of that obviously i've got my containers i suggest you use large containers i'll show you mine large being like 30 centimeters wide, 30 centimeters deep is my suggestion. I'm saying that because uh, having experimented with many different size containers, the small ones, you need to water them more um, and they're more susceptible to temperature swings in the spring. And that is the thing that is going to kill your plants. And you're gonna be so sad because you overwintered them, you babied them, you saw them sprout when it got a little bit warm in February or March, and then a frost is gonna come and kill them and it's just devastating. So don't do not do what I did and cried about. <laughs> Instead, uh, get large containers. Durable um, and flexible is important. So um, ceramic, not a great idea for overwintering because the water in those ceramic um, containers is gonna freeze, expand, and crack. So plastic works the what i use you'll see are these um they're called root pouches it's a um fibrous felty material that's made out of um a matted felty fiber made out of um pet basically like water bottles that were broken down and scooped out of the ocean <laughs> so i don't know it, it they work for me and that's what i recommend for everybody but you do you there's lots of different ways to do containers try it out um, I told you about the knife, the secateur, the little rakes and stuff. Watering can is an absolute must. And if you want to get exercise going back and forth, 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 <laughs> then you could use the watering can. I got bored of that. And so I got a hose. And so this is my hose hookup. It goes, it attaches to the sink in my kitchen. And then I bring it out and I, I water my plants that way. And it's just a little bit quicker. Um, you are going to want to put that in a bucket so you don't get water all over the place. Um, twine, I don't actually use zip ties anymore. I use hemp twine to tie things to my railing or to uh, stakes if I want to train them. Bamboo rods, oh my gosh, I just bought some bamboo rods. I'll show you what they're for, but it's water indication. Tarp, we'll talk about the tarp in a second. Um, and the mulch, uh, mulch leaves, yes, uh, we'll talk about that in a second too. Um, okay, so the right plants for the right place. Um, so this is what I've become obsessed with. In, in my learning, I, at first I just tried any old plant um, and a lot of them died. <laughs> uh, over time, the plants taught me through their death and survival that I'm an idiot and that I need to pay attention to the right habitat for the right place. So the, the plants that survive in containers are those plants that are adapted to shallow soil ecosystems. There are very many 
plants adapted to shallow soil ecosystems. And there are many different types of shallow soil ecosystems in Southern Ontario and actually around the world, but we're talking about native plants of Southern Ontario. So let's focus on those ecosystems. They are shorelines, which are mostly, you know, rocky bouldery places where little bits of soil are accumulating between the cracks. And so here's a lovely um, camas lily um, growing in the crack of a, a shoreline. Um, lots of different plants, so Campanula um, harebell does this as well. Strawberries do this as well. Um, so check out, go, like go to an actual shoreline, see what plants are growing in the cracks of the rocks. Those are good shallow soil plants. Alvars, if you don't know what an alvar is, you need to visit one. Um, it's, a, it's a globally rare ecosystem and 75% of that rare ecosystem is in Ontario. So that's really, really cool. They are shallow soil, literally by definition, less than 15 centimeters of soil above um, bedrock. So uh, the Canadian shield, you know, granite, um, just like a huge slab of rock. So this is a picture of them. There's you, you, Sometimes they look like a literal parking lot with cracks in them. And again, soil accumulates in the cracks. You have a little bit of soil on top and they're usually very open, very sunny. So this is, this is basically like your rooftop or, or your south facing balcony could be an alvar. Um, alvar plants are amazing and beautiful and unique and special and I love them. <laughs> and you should grow them on your balcony. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are also such things as shallow forests. So these exist all through the Niagara Escarpment, all the way up into the Saugeen Peninsula, Manitoulin Island, if you wanted to go that far. Um, and there's lots and lots of plants that live, including giant trees, actually. Like there's maple trees um, that live in this ecosystem that is like covered in boulders and the soil is super shallow. Obviously those, those trees are digging their roots down in between the cracks and getting to the water table. So I'm not sure that I would recommend growing a sugar maple, but um, the plants that are growing in the understory, including lots of different types of violets, here you can see uh, wild ramps, um, various ferns, wild columbine, um, geraniums, all sorts of different species live in these shallow forests. Go, go just walk the entire Bruce, Bruce Trail, why don't you? <laughs> and check out the plants that grow along and you will be inspired. Um, the other place to look for are cliffs. So cliffs like the Scarborough Bluffs, for example. Did you need an excuse to go visit the Scarborough Bluffs? I don't know why you did, but now you have it. So go visit and check out the plants. There are a lot of very interesting um, plants that live right on the edge of the cliffs, blown by wind, um, dealing with intense erosion. This is not actually Scarborough Bluffs. This is um, 16 Mile Creek in Oakville. So another place to look for are valley slopes, valley slopes that are experiencing erosion. Obviously, the soils here are more clay, um, but you can try growing in clay too. Why not? Um, there were witch hazels in here, for which reason I started trying to grow a witch hazel in my container garden. Didn't work so well. But interestingly, lots of different plants along um, cliffs and valley slopes too. Um, so that's that. We're going through a lot of different things here. How are, how are the questions? Or, or, let's pause on ecosystems for a second. <laughs> did, did anyone have questions about ecosystems? Yeah, well, uh, not on the ecosystems, but in terms of uh, the ver question around species of Virginia mm. creeper on your balcony mm -hmm. to mitigate wind effect in the growing season for the rest of your plants. Yeah. And I think then it's... perhaps you can have slightly larger leafed plants. Yeah. I, I think that's a really smart idea. Um, Virginia creeper could do very well. It lives in shallow soils. Um, it can deal with part sun or like low, like pretty shady conditions too, uh, but it grows quite vigorously. Otherwise I would, if it really starts to take off, I would, uh, you know, get ready to prune because you don't necessarily want your balcony experience to <laughs> turn out to be like your whole building, your whole condo. But I think I think it's definitely doable. Um, another vine that could work that I've tried is um, clematis, wild um, virgin's bower, sometimes called um, clematis virginiana. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's a fine idea. But it's it's a trade-off, right? Because if you 
if you do that virgin the the that vine it's going to also block out a bunch of light so now mm. A lot of my plants are actually, they love all the sun that they get and they grow more vigorously that way. So I would just be, you know, I'd be cre creating a little bit of a shadier situation that way. And I mean, that's not, nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's just choices. You're making choices. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Have you tried willows, uh, for example, pussy willow as an early bloomer for pollinators? I have not, um, but I've, I think you should do it. So pussy willow likes a lot of water. So get ready to water it a bunch or maybe put a liner. So I've done this for some of my containers that are more like more of a shoreline or a wet ecosystem mimic. I'll line the inside of the container with plastic. Like I'll, I'll use a, um, you know, my potting soil, I'll get it in, in bulk and then the, the leftover bag that the potting soil came in, I'll just stick that into my container, lining mm. the inside of it, fill it with soil, and then um, and then it's going to retain a lot of water, a lot, a lot, a lot of water. And then you could almost have like a bog or whatever. Mm. So yeah, Pussy Willow might like a situation like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give it a try. Okay, very cool. Um, and I can hold off on the on this question. It has to do with soil, not quite ecosystem but no, okay. let's do it. Let's can do you it. reuse soil from year to year so yeah um you definitely can um i recommend adding a little bit of of compost every year so oh we'll get to that next actually that's a wonderful transition i'm going to use that as a transition to this thing so these are some of the resources that i've helped work on at wwf today i kind of have my wwf hat on half it's half on <laughs> half on half off um but one of the things that I'm mildly proud of is we created this this wheel diagram, which bears a this resemblance to the to indigenous medicine wheels. I wasn't thinking of that at the time, but you know, there it is. Um, anyway, what we talk about are the things to do at different times of year, and we didn't have container gardens in mind, but it sort of kind of works um, for for the most part. So. In spring, I like to fertilize a little bit. And by fertilize, I mean compost. You're adding a little bit of compost. So it could be if you do composting at home, take a handful, throw it in. in. Uh, you could also buy worm castings or composted manure, a little bit of added nutrient. You know, you, you got to get those um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and those micronutrients. Plants need it. They can make their own vitamins, which is amazing. They make vitamins out of light and air. I love that, but they they can't make minerals, um, so you have to you have to get that in there. Um, in the summertime, um, watering is really important. Weeding may also be important. I do actually weed um, even in my little gardens. I I get grass seeds come in, um, like poa, Kentucky bluegrass, and and others. And um, there's a few other species that come in. I'm not sure if they're coming in through the soil or the compost or they're blowing in but a variety of, um, there's only about three species and I know them all now and I mostly eat them. <laughs> uh, I know I know who they are and when they're little, I just pick them and I eat them. I act like a little herbivore. I think the best way to weed is to pretend that you're a herbivore that loves to eat that weed plant that you don't want to be there and then just go in there and nom, 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 nom. If you can eat it, obviously make sure that it's an edible plant. If it's not, then you compost it, you know, fine. Um, collect and scatter seeds in the fall, do a little bit of protecting in the winter. So we've le I've learned some things about the protecting. And you can check out this thing that exists. It's on the WWF website. It's all about container gardening with native plants. Um, OK, we're moving to thoughts on design. So this is where I start really making things up because I'm not a designer horticulturist of any description. but. This is my aesthetic, my my way of thinking. Uh, design is an art is subjective, but there's beauty in nature, I believe. And um, here are some thoughts. <laughs> um, think about plants of different heights. So I learned this thing: spillers, fillers, thrillers. That's I stole that from the horticulture world. So you can think about filling your container with 
some plants that kind of are really low and spill off the sides. Other plants like I like using grasses and sedges for this that are mostly um, handsome foliage that fills up the midsection. And then thrillers are sort of tall plants that have a, a gorgeous show of color, colorful blooms, for example. Um, swamp milkweed would be a great example of a thriller that's amazing for containers. Um, if, you, if you combine these, you can get something very beautiful, I think. Um, bloom time. So yeah, think about, think about spring, summer, and fall. Um, I, it, it gives me so much joy, so, so much joy to have early blooming plants in my containers. Strawberries, violets, and prairie smoke are great examples of plants that bloom um, in April and May that time when you need that boost from the long winter <laughs> you need something colorful and beautiful and, and uh happy in the garden um you'd be crazy not to try to get that in there obviously summer is going to be your time for most of the pollinators um and then late fall asters and goldenrods are the key to extending your bloom time all the way into november there's no reason that you can't have a bloom time extending into November. And the way to do it is with asters and golden rods. Um, yeah, but it's not all about blooms. So there's also leaf shape and texture. So think about like, there's lots of different colors of green. There's, there's yellow green, blue green, waxy green. Um, you get different types of leaf and vein texture, broad leaves, thin leaves, um, hairs, like you can make your garden a sensory experience. I often have my hands in there and I'm touching and feeling things. Um, there's velvety leaved plants. So there's lots of different ways you can get creative with just the green parts of the plants. Um, aroma, I think is really, really big. Um, here's all my plants that I grow that smell nice. <laughs> um, I, yeah, this is a huge thing for me. I've realized over time is smelly plants are great and you get to experience them and like you don't even have to hurt them. You can just like rub their leaves a little bit and and it's great. It, it gives me a little a little pickup um, every time I do that. Um, cedar, white cedar should actually be, I have question marks here because I've never grown it, but that should actually work well in a container technically according to its habitat and growth form and whatnot. So somebody try it and then tell me how it goes. Um, yeah, and, and then like, I, this is just a, I don't know, <laughs> funny thing that I like to think about is like, a lot of people think about like beauty in a garden as being like color and showy and, and, and whatnot, um, like a beautiful summer dress. But I think there's something to say about like handsomeness in plants too. It's, it's like an understated, um, just, chicness um, that you can get from certain plants like grasses, sedges, and ferns, I think are all very handsome. Um, yeah. Oh, so tarps, tarp. Okay, so this is what I used to do with tarps. Um, you can see this is back when I used to do smaller containers and I failed a lot at this and I thought the reason was I need to protect my plants better. Turns out the answer is actually don't use small containers. But you can do this. Um, so I used to wrap up my, my plants up in tarps. This was, you can see also when I was doing my shade cloth. Um, I don't know, like it, it, it works. It does, it does work to a certain extent. Um, but what I found is I don't actually need to do that anymore. Um, so that was another way that I did it a different year. Okay, so yeah, container. Technically this is a container. So this is, this is like a little boulevard thing. It's a raised bed next to my condo parking lot. And it's kind of like a long skinny container. So I have grown it with a whole bunch of different native plant species. And so in a way, like once you start thinking about containers, like everything is a container, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> um, oh, this was really to show that something really cool, I think that's unique about container gardens is you can grow certain plants. Like on the left we have, there's yellow pimpernel here on the side. And over here, I have this one called um, Houstonia that are very, very small, delicate plants that if you tried growing them in um, a larger garden bed, they would just be totally swallowed up and lost. They might be perfectly happy and like 
come back every year, but you're never really going to see them. They're just going to get swallowed up by the massive vegetation around them. But in a container, they're lifted up and they're featured and they, you can get your face right in them. So think about that uh, with container gardens as like showcases for smaller, more delicate kind of plants. That's an interesting thing to think about. Oh, here's a fun story of the time that a Canada goldenrod colonized <laughs> my container. So there's, I saw this little seedling growing in July and I'm sure it, it was a seed that blew in. It started growing in July. This is what it looked like in, in September. This is how crazy this plant is. And then, and then by um, November, it had turned into this and look how many seeds it produced. And did I pull it out of my container? Yes, I did. Cause I was terrified that it was gonna kill all the rest of the plants in there. But did I shake? the plant so that all of its seeds would go everywhere and blow in the wind yes i did do that as well because <laughs> that was quite a feat um huge huge props to canada goldenrod for its amazing amazing ability to grow and support like this is the plant for bees by the way if you want to help bees and monarch butterflies on their mon on their journey south in the fall you cannot do better than canada goldenrod so that is why don't we do a little bit of Q and A? Are there more questions? Um, just one: Has the black swallowtail butterfly found your pimpernel? Which ah. kind of connects to other questions that I've received around um, who you can expect to arrive, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know, different height. Like if people yeah, live yeah. on the fifteenth floor or the sixteenth floor, yeah, is anybody going to be there? You know. And so on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. They so kind of interrelate. I've been waiting patiently for my butterfly experience. <laughs> um, fact is, even six floors up is pretty high for a butterfly. I do see monarchs flying past um, in the mm. fall when they're migrating, but they are on a mission. They're they're going they're going to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> and they do not want to stop by my balcony. They're gonna they're gonna go somewhere else. Um, my my feeling is that mostly butterflies are are staying low for wind purposes, and also like it it costs a lot. It's it's expensive to fly up high unless you're soaring, migrating like those monarchs do. So I wouldn't hold out for butterflies. If it happens to you, please do take pictures and post it on iNaturalist and then send them to me. Um, but what I've had happen sometimes is if you get really lucky and you go to a native plant nursery, you will buy a plant and it comes with eggs <laughs> on mm. the native plant. Mm. And so I have had monarch caterpillars and um, black swallowtail and I've had um, painted lady butterfly caterpillars all on plants that came from the nursery. Um, and then I grew them up and they got eaten by birds. <laughs> happens sorry um but you know that's important food, food for the food chain right yeah. um but the most likely visitors you're gonna have are will be will be bees and i have heard of people getting bees as high as the 19th floor i got a picture from someone who found a bee at the, on their 19th floor balcony which is pretty amazing um but i would say like yeah six to eight I was I was on an eight story or an, an eighth floor rooftop um, uh, roof rooftop garden just earlier this week and it, there were bees all over the place honeybees hmm. and, and bumblebees so that is definitely not too high I would say even 10, 10 stories you'd expect to see lots of bees um, just keep in mind they probably aren't going to show up until July or so usually hmm. May and June they're they're bumbling around. At ground level, you know, building their colonies, and you've probably talked about uh, bee habitat and their life cycles and what they're up to, but they really don't start to get too exploratory until later in the season. But then once they start coming in July, I continue to see bumblebees um, all the way through November. They come and they 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 hang out with my goldenrods all the way through to November, fattening up as they do. So. Um, and then birds. Birds will absolutely use your balcony. Um, so I like to leave seed heads of mostly asters, goldenrods, mint family, um, any any that make clusters of fairly large seeds. Those are natural bird feeders. And yeah, the birds love them. They 
they think that's great. Also, actually, even in the springtime, birds use my plants. Sometimes they'll strip the bark uh, or like the, the outer sort of layer of um, papery skin on the outsides of the stems, which I leave. I always leave the stems. I don't, I don't trim things down anymore. I leave everything in. Um, and yeah, I've seen birds like small birds like red winged blackbirds will grab on and use their beak and sort of like pull and strip and bundle up the little um, bits of, I want to call it skin, I don't know, bark. It's not quite that, but that stuff. <laughs> and then I guess they fly off and use it in their nests. Um, so yeah, you will, you, you can do bird habitat for sure. Cool. Um, have you had any stem nesting bees and, mm. uh, Oh yeah, the second question, go on. First answer, um, not confirmed, but I will tell you a story. There was another another Project Swallowtail person, maybe she's here. I can't remember who it was, but if, if so, please speak up. Somebody once talked about bringing containers indoors um, and that they'd had an experience where they brought a container indoors in the spring because they were worried about a, a late frost and a bumblebee came out of the container that had <laughs> nested in their container over the winter. And then it emerged and started flying around and they caught it and put it in a Tupperware container and, and stuck it in the fridge to rehibernate for a couple more weeks before putting them back out, which I thought was really, really cool. That has not happened to me. Um, and I, yeah, I, I can't confirm, I suppose, it's one of those things where I feel it's like a, if in, in order to find out, I would have to destroy the thing that I'm using to try to be the habitat. So I don't know. That's one of those weird things where like, I almost, I don't know. I just, I just don't know, but I, I hope I leave them there and, and maybe, maybe it'll happen. Um, yeah. Right on. This one is, uh, slightly longer question, but are, mm. are you in favor of limiting the amount of watering by choosing plants that don't require water? Mm. Uh, so plants for drier conditions. So uh, this is a question from Douglas. Douglas says, I'm advising on a west facing ground level condo garden mm. and think it would be best to suggest plants that thrive in dry conditions in order to be mm -hmm. low maintenance. Yeah, good question, uh, Douglas. I suppose it depends on how much maintenance the garden wants to do yeah. as tending yeah. a garden is part of the joy of gardening. Yeah, I think this is really a philosophical question. Um, and it, it has to do with that thing around like, how much effort do you want to put in? Mm -hmm. um, some people have the philosophy that, you know, if there are water shortages in the world. And, um, you know, particularly if I was living somewhere like California or like a desert um, type ecosystem, I would want to, like philosophically, I would feel that it's important to reduce my watering as much as possible. And so then mm -hmm. you take on a zero scaping approach. Maybe you, you do like succulents and cacti and things like that and really, really try to reduce watering to a bare minimum. That would be an interesting challenge. I also think that giving yourself challenges, engineering challenges like that is a really great way to spur creativity. Um, mm -hmm. So, I like the idea of constraining yourself. It's a really, a really fun thing to do. Um, but yeah, I, I could see people on the other hand, I could see maybe people like doing daily watering. And so maybe like having smaller containers and you grow like, geez, I grew tomatoes. Like they need water every darn day. You miss one day and they're like <laughs> shrivel up into a crispy, um, sad mess. And yeah, some people love that, like feeling so deeply responsible that if they if they miss one day, it's like a devastation. That's that's like high stakes, <laughs> you know. It's it's exciting. So I think it really it comes down to that, like, what are your goals? How do you want to relate to the plants and the garden space? And there's no right or wrong answer to that. Um. Okay. So let me figure out who this grass is. Uh, prairie smoke. Okay, so I, I tufted have hair like, grass. It was tufted hair grass the whole time. I don't even know that species. Well, How? I didn't There's either. There's so many grasses. There's too so many. many There's too many. And it's true what what uh, Joe said, by the way, that like there's a lot. There's not much 
abundance of native grasses. There are many species, but they're they're not like they don't cover a large area. But anyway. Yeah, I mean most yeah, little blue stems that I've seen grow. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen them like fill out and take no, over. No, no, they're just an little. They just grow in just, clumps. Yeah, little clumpy guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in here we have prairie smoke. How many prairie smokes again? Two. There's two of them up at okay. the front. Um, two gray goldenrods, one Virginia mountain mint in the middle, and then those two tufted hair grass. So this one is the only one that is freshly planted this year. Okay, this guy okay. is inspired by plants that I found growing in boulder ditches <laughs> um, by the highway. <laughs> and it is um, Virginia mountain mint, Canada wild rye, um, there's this little baby Monarda in here. Uh, there's a little strawberry guy and another prairie smoke and some other stuff. Um, just little random things. Um, this one is the cylindric blazing star, which has got these, these oh. narrow grassy leaves. And then the thing, oh my word. Okay, in the back is Canada hawkweed and it's growing it's so much smaller this year but it's going to bloom much smaller than it did last year that's fascinating don't know why a common names always a nightmare but is hawkweed sometimes also called fireweed now different yeah. okay all right cool um this also has lots of wild strawberry in it some wild columbine and that's it um did the wild this, strawberry spread on its own between container yeah. to container to yeah, just look, like tossed out runners and then just like look oh what <gasps> yeah look it's all they're they're going everywhere that's yes so they your totally... containers are connected by <laughs> strawberry runners that's correct yes oh my god <laughs> um so in here we have canada no we have um common blue violet northern bed straw smooth aster, sweet grass, and one big old so common evening When you decided primrose. to plant these fellas together, ah. um, you were mentioning earlier, you know, you think about height, you think about bloom color, mm -hmm. bloom time. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking of that when you're planting each container or are you thinking of that when you're planting like your whole balcony? I tried it. It's too much to think about, honestly, today. It's like, I just, <laughs> I, I just, I try things. And what, what I was actually thinking about when I planted this one was a riverside. Plants that I've seen growing mm. along a riverside. So sweet grass, bed straw, violet, they're all plants that I've seen, and smooth aster, I've seen growing together in a riverside. So this is one of the containers that I have a liner in. So it's, it's extra moist. And then I just threw the the um primrose in there because i mm. it was just needed a spot but i do see them growing by riverside sometimes but yeah other like there's so many different things right. to think about all at once it's just it's overwhelming so <laughs> um this you, you just can't go wrong just try stuff it's all good so um hoary vervain yellow pimpernel and wild strawberry mostly in here with the little baby um the little guys of nodding wild onion and there's actually a sedge in here too there's a black fruited sedge this little grassy oh wow. grassy number in here that's just like just a seems grass. pretty happy i know it's really far down there i know yeah black fruited sedge oh my word how did i oh they're blooming right now holy shit the the evening primroses are little literally opening now like it's happening right now are oh, you seeing this wow. this is cracking open do you see the yellow I do. That just happened. That actually just happened. If we wait, we will actually see this flower bloom in the next 20, probably, pro oh my gosh. Okay, let's just, let's just chill on that. Wow, I'm way too excited. That's very cool. <laughs> so um, for those of you who didn't know, uh, Ryan did his master's on Primrose. Uh, yeah. So there's a particularly deep connection between him and that plant. Okay, and here's I'm gonna... your double flowering columbine. Are you collecting seeds off of these already? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I will. Okay. I will collect seeds. Is they're not quite ready yet? They're still green. Mm, but I'm, okay. I'm going to keep an eye on this primrose, but it's literally going to bloom like right now. That's um, so we got more Canada wild rye, the columbine, and there's another little hawkweed that started growing in there, and rocks. I'm also yeah. So I'm noticing you've added 
like rock and gravel features over top like yeah. you know on the on the on the top and is that aesthetic uh, partly aesthetic, aesthetic partly okay. it's a moisture thing mm. but like here i was trying to replicate like a shoreline situation kind of deal mm. so those like rocky rocky crevices and things oh you're so. trying to create like a crag ah, yeah, see, yeah, see. yeah 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 so that's cool. that one this one's the dune one so it's sand and i've got uh opuntia so um your prickly pear is prickly, bumping. Yeah. Prickly pear is doing so well this year. All these paddles, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, are all brand new from this year. And wow. I'm so happy about it. And then that sand drop seed, the grass, a little bit of wild strawberry. And then this is just a baby, um, baby um, foxglove beard tongue that I'm growing. Here's, ooh, yeah. So the common evening primrose in here. And a, this is, um, an uh, iris, actually a, a blue flag iris that really did not like the wind. <laughs> Just really, <laughs> really it was like, what is this? I've well, never experienced shorelines, rivers, very sheltered, typically. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> it was, this has never in like 200 million years of, no, not quite, but like <laughs> 20 million years of evolution <laughs> had never experienced that much wind before. <laughs> um, and then this, um, this here is the, the woodland container. So it's got bottle brush grass, zigzag goldenrod, um, Christmas fern, the blue, common blue violet, woodland strawberry. And I actually tried, <laughs> didn't really like the wind either, but that is um, uh, toothwort, large leaved toothwort. Oh. So it's got a root that tastes like wasabi. Oh, wow. Oh, right. You were also thinking of growing wasabi somehow in a container. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about that. Oh, Janet asks, oh. how heavy is your sandbag? Too heavy. Yeah, because you're <laughs> going to need to move that. And I can only imagine. That's why I rolled it down. That one's only a half height because I was like, if I make this a full height thing, I'm never going to be able to move it. <laughs> That's a good call. OK, even more so shallow rooted. Yeah. So Okay, do you, do you see this? This yes. that's happening. Okay, so, so Janet called them uh, primrose horns. Is yeah, that like an official term for them. The horns, yeah. So that's the little the little blossoms. But what's happening here is it's stuck. This part is just a little bit stuck, and oh. it's just it's just like it's gonna pop. I could if I touched it, it would probably pop open. But I don't I don't want to do that. I'm gonna let it do its own thing. Okay, anyway, yeah, cool. Um, yeah. So I think that's everything. Is there um, a, too many plants? Can you have too many plants in a pot, in a in the thirty centimeter by thirty centimeter root pouches well, that are yeah, too ideal? Yeah, like okay. So the, sometimes the the sweet grass gets to be too much in this container sometimes. And but what I do is I just dig some out and and propagate it up and then I share it with people. Okay. So. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. You can always make a little bit of extra room in that way. I like to have a little bit of like empty space or like a little bit of soil showing because I think that's cool. Um, right. And also, like, as you mentioned point. earlier, somebody having that bumblebee living in their container. Yeah. That that bare soil is crucial for, you know, our ground nesting bees and, and overwintering. So, yeah, totally. Oh, this primrose is like so ready to go, <laughs> but it's not going yet. OK, I, I'm just going to keep making you wait and wait and wait for the primrose, but I'm, I'm, let's not. <laughs> Very fair. Uh, thank you once again, um, Ryan. This was awesome. Really Sweet. appreciate your time and everybody's time for still being here. Diane, Douglas, Janet, Marilyn, thank you. Uh, Switch it around. Janet says, at sunset, the primrose blooms. It sure uh, does. It sure does. <laughs> and it's uh, going to. It's just sometimes they take their precious time, but it's worth the wait. If if it blooms, do take a photo of it. And oh, I, I can edit it into like the video once it goes in. I'll just I'll say, you know, a few minutes later this <laughs> occurred. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah. yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. Really appreciate your time tonight. It was almost two hours. Is is <laughs> so thank you for for spending all that time sharing your experience, your knowledge with us. Yeah. Um, and thank you to everybody who stuck around. And yeah, thanks, friend. Okay. I will.
be in touch with you next week. Have a wonderful long weekend and bomb up. Go up, man.